On April 5, 1975, a conference entitled The Central Intelligence Agency and World Peace was held in New Haven, Connecticut, on the campus of Yale University. From the opening session of the conference, Ernest DeMeo talks about CIA involvement with international labor, focusing on Chile. Mr. DeMeo is the representative from the World Federation of Trade Unions to the United Nations. Ernest DeMeo. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, CIA and FBI agents, I think it would be naive to assume that a gathering such as this wasn't under surveillance. Uh, it would be interesting to know how many reports that the FBI has filed were generated by the activities of the CIA. If we are to understand the CIA, we must first take a look at the socio-economic system that spawned it. Our society is a social and economic system based on the exploitation of the many by the few who own and control the capital goods which produce the nation's wealth and the financial institutions that are its lifeblood. The powerful few with their great economic resources control the political life of the nation. Unless some of you here think that Ford is the president of this country and is running it. <laughs> they maintain a shadow government that makes the basic decisions that are relayed to the executive and legislative branches of the overt government through henchmen placed in strategic positions throughout the federal apparatus. This is reflected in the interlocking relationships between the major financial and industrial corporations with government. Eisenhower called it the military-industrial complex. This is the major reason for corruption in government. The purpose of government as conceived by the founding fathers was to promote the general welfare. The shadow government has prostituted this into promoting the welfare of the generals. General Electric, General Dynamic, and the Pentagon Brass. <laughs> Over the years, I'm a little conservative. Over the years, government has gotten beyond the reach of the people, unable to influence the government, frustrated and alienated. The voters are avoiding the polls like a plague. They have been the victims of presidential lies and deception and shades of Imperial Rome, they have seen the White House put on the auction block. Creep was Nixon's bagman. If you don't know what creep was, you won't know what bagman is. <laughs> it collected from the major corporations for presidential favors at the expense of the people. None of this went unnoticed or unchallenged. Over the years, there were courageous men and women in the universities, the arts and sciences, and the trade unions. They spoke out, organized, and held meetings such as this. Their ranks were infiltrated by government agents, paid informers who fingered the brave and testified that they were subversive agents of a foreign power or something worse, part of a vague catch-all, the communist conspiracy. How many here recall that President Eisenhower was called a card-carrying communist? and the Supreme Court a part of the com communist conspiracy. It all happened. The mass media turned the witch hunt into a Roman circus while lives and careers were destroyed. After over 40 years of surveillance and investigations by the FBI, I can't get too excited about the fact that the CIA also got into the act. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not dismissing the CIA. I believe that neither the CIA nor the FBI, the IRS, the Army, or any other agency of government should do the dirty work of the transnational corporations who run the country. If we are to remain a free people, the TNCs, as any Yale undergraduate can tell you, not only dominate the U.S. scene, but have also extended their tentacles throughout most of the world. The most important historical development in recent years is the rise of the once colonial nations which have cast off their imperialist oppressors. They have established political independence, but in many of these new nations, the old imperial masters still control the economy. 
Their raw materials, utilities, transport, and such industry as they have are controlled by transnational corporations based mainly in the United States. Anyone familiar with the economic history of South America, its trade and payment patterns, knows that the major U.S. corporations have bled that continent white. Our government, fronting for these corporations, has used its military power to keep it that way for years. However, in this enlightened age, the U.S. government doesn't necessarily resort to naked military power. Military intervention occurs only after other efforts have failed. There are other options. We train their military officers, corrupt them, and then use them to overthrow the governments their people have elected to power. Chile was something out of the ordinary. I went down there last year on a commission of inquiry. I don't intend to go into it lengthily, but there are a few things I do want to say. Democracy was strongly entrenched in Chile and the military tolerated civilian control. The Chileans tried something new. They sought to achieve control of their economic and political destinies by peaceful means through the electoral process. Despite considerable CIA interference, Salvador Allende, at the head of a Marxist coalition, won a plurality of votes in a tight three-way election. Nothing the CIA and the Copper Trust did could keep Allende out of the presidency. This experiment in peaceful change was aborted by the intervention of the U.S. government. The CIA was used to destabilize the Allende regime. Is that a honey of a word? destabilize the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States adopted by the United Nations over U.S. objections, Chapter 2, Article 1, reads as follows. Quote, every state has the sovereign and inalienable right to choose its economic system as well as its political, social, and cultural systems in accordance with the will of its people without outside interference coercion or threat in any form whatsoever. Article 2, Section 1 states, quote, every state has and shall freely exercise full permanent sovereignty, including possession, use, and disposal over all its wealth, natural resources, and economic activities, close quote. Needless to say, these principles did not guide our government in Chile. Where the imperial might of U.S. transnational corporations to exploit other peoples is involved, our government will do whatever has to be done to preserve that dubious right. The details of what the CIA did or let happen in Chile, the assassination of the generals who stood in the way, the bribing of others to carry out the coup, the slaughter, arrests, and torture of thousands will be told by others. However, there are a few things I want to point out. After the coup, all political parties, right, center, and left, were banned. The Congress building in Santiago now is the national headquarters of the military police. That's appropriate for, mil for a military state. All opposition newspapers have been closed down. The universities are run by the military. The Escudo, during the latter days of the Allende regime, exchanged at 500 to the U.S. dollar. On March 3, 1975, the New York Times reported that the Escudo had again been devalued to 2,900 to the dollar. This is an official devaluation for foreign exchange purposes of 580% in 18 months. When we think of the distress caused by 12% inflation in this country last year, we can only guess at the mass misery that prevails on the conditions of almost total impoverishment in Chile. A reliable yardstick to measure the degree of democracy that exists in any society is the existence of trade unions which effectively defend and advance the interests of the, and welfare of the workers and the people generally. We now know that the CIA did some of its most destructive work in the Chilean trade unions. They corrupted the leaders and financed strikes against the Allende government. Their objective was not to make apolitical unions under the aegis of the American Institute of Free Labor Development, AFELD. 
the infamous industry and CIA-financed AFFL-CIO front for the building of class collaborationist unions in South America. Their purpose, aided, abetted, and financed by the CIO, was to wreck a friendly government. The consequences to the workers has been unrelieved disaster. The honest trade union leaders have been arrested, tortured, or murdered. Others have been driven underground or into exile. Union headquarters have been padlocked. The unions cannot function. The corrupt CIA-supported unionists who struck against Allende are not leading strikes today against far worse conditions. The Junta has tried to set up a labor front with them without success. There have been several CIA-engineered counter-revolutions in Latin America, but none have been as savage as the Chilean junta. It seems that we are engaged in the reprehensible business of trying to drown revolutionary ideas in blood. It hasn't worked in Southeast Asia. It didn't work in Greece or Portugal. It isn't working in Spain, and it won't work in Chile. What is happening in the world today is not the dominoes falling, it is the growing resentment and reactions of the peoples of the world against our transnational corporation-run government. <clears throat> and I want to make a distinction between our country and our government. The corrupt code of sharp business practices is a poor and unworkable substitute for the high principles of the founding fathers of our country. The Chilean events have added a new debate a new dimension to the age-old struggle of peoples for political, economic, and social emancipation. It has already lowered the tolerance level of acceptable opposition in the ongoing struggle for the minds of the people. The immediate reaction in Peru to the Chilean developments was to close down the opposition press. In Portugal, the irresponsible ultra-left and right suspected of CIA connections have been restricted. When the U.S. government failed to redeem its pledges to aid in the restoration of North Vietnam, when it continued to aid the Thu regime in its violations of the Paris Agreements, when it continued its reactionary role in Cambodia, the revolutionary forces of Southeast Asia responded in what they believe from long and bitter experience is the only language the U.S. government understands. The demise of our client states is predictable. What bothers me most is if we permit the CIA and other agencies of our government to effectively deny to other people their democratic rights and aspirations, how long do we retain them for ourselves? When our government engages in economic warfare, subsidizes the opposition press, organizes strikes, disruption, and mass demonstrations, it is crippling the normal democratic process and the economy of these countries. It prevents the small adjustments in policies and application that resolves day-to-day -day problems and keeps them from becoming big, unwieldy, and explosive. If we have contempt for the legal process in other countries, can we maintain respect for the law here? Ask Richard Nixon. <clears throat> Watergate was bringing home to the American people what our government practices abroad. The shadow government is now conducting an unannounced subliminal campaign. The general outline is that democracy is slow and cumbersome, and it questions whether it can survive the conditions created by modern technology. It is further suggested that what is required to meet the problems posed by the current realities is an authoritarian state, a euphemism for fascism. And that is what is usually meant when you hear talk about we should strengthen the presidency. To what point? Dictatorship? The only form of government that works for the people is democracy. It is hardly necessary to recount the transient glories of Mussolini's Hitler, Italy, Mussolini's Italy, Hitler's Germany, Salazar's Portugal, the Colonel's Greece, and Franco's Spain. The handwriting is there for all to see. There is no future for fascism.
Democracy works, but it has been a long time since it has been effectively used in this country. Democracy has been shelled. What we have is the inefficient government of, by, and for the transnational corporations. They have used their power to impoverish the people. Swart union organization corrupt much of it. They have lowered the living standards of the people. They have idled production facilities and millions of workers at a time when there are vast unmet personal and social needs. The monopolies have given us endless preparation for war. They have drafted our youth to die in brush fire wars to defend the vital interests of the transnational corporations. In their mad drive for maximum profits, they have created conditions that not only reduce their profits, but also threaten the stability of their economic and social system. When we go after the CIA, we are taking on the strong arm agency of the power structure. In this continuing endeavor, we shall have to control and curb the monopolies and their transnational operations. They have the power of the government. We have the potential support of the people. It is an unequal contest. With history and the people on our side, we cannot lose. In this disparate struggle, the monopolies have already lost the battle for the minds of the people. This is why they resort to infiltration, entrapment, disruption, provocation, and terror. No matter how real or psychological the terror may be, they are the weapons of the defeated. They cannot win, we cannot lose. It has been said that the long journey begins with a single step, and that step has been taken a long time ago. We make our contribution when we dedicate ourselves to mobilize the democratic forces of the people, together, we can bring back to America what Lincoln talked about, government of, by, and for the people. In the lively pursuit of this objective, we shall establish the basic prerequisite of enduring peace. Thank you. In the second half of this program, John Marks discusses the clandestine mentality Mr. Marx is a former State Department intelligence officer and co-author of the bestseller, The CIA and the Cult of Intelligence. John Marx. I could give you a long laundry list of some of the things the CIA has done around the world. And, I mean, it is fairly impressive, I suppose, when you add it up over the years. I mean, starting in the late 1940s, trying to organize resistance movements in places like Albania and Poland and the Ukraine and not getting too far, and then finding much more success in the third world. The CIA overthrowing a government in Guatemala in 1953, overthrowing the government of Iran in 1954 and putting the Shah back on the throne so he could shake us down on the oil prices a little later on. In 1958, the CIA tries to overthrow the government of Sukarno in Indonesia and fails, and the President of the United States, Eisenhower, I think it was, lied openly about that CIA intervention. In 1961, the CIA tries to overthrow the government of Castro in Cuba at the Bay of Pigs and fails very badly. Uh, not to be undaunted, the CIA continues for 10 years after that, continuing guerrilla operations against Cuba. Uh, organizing at least half a dozen assassination attempts, a few of which involved the Mafia, which is an interesting combination when you have the Mafia and the CIA, and you can get into some wonderful arguments about which organization has more honor, and I don't know where that would come out, but, but then you, in Chile, they try, the CIA tries to stop Allende in 58 elections, in 64 elections, and the 1970 elections finally fails and then has to overthrow him in 1973. Indochina, continuing intervention from the early 1950s into the present, something that's come back to haunt us. But, I mean, you could just go all over the world. You don't find a country in the third world where the CIA hasn't intervened or one fashion or another over the years. Uh, that We know that. I mean... <laughs> That's something that probably everybody in this room learned a little, few years ago and is trying to perhaps do something about. So I just want to tell you two stories. The first one is a Philip Agee story. Uh, Philip Agee is a former CIA operative who now resides in England. He's written a book called Inside the Company, which is the most detailed account of what the CIA actually does in a particular country in the field. 
Uh, AG was in Ecuador and Uruguay. And Uruguay, which, if, as you all remember, was this, the country of state of siege, is the country that interests me as far as this story is concerned. AG was the CIA's contact man with the local police and intelligence services. Uh, he was the guy who recruited agents in the Uruguayan secret police, who slipped secret money to them, helped in their training, and whatever. And at one point in the mid-1960s, I believe the year was 1966, AG was asked by the head of the uh, Montevideo Police Intelligence Squad for the name of a local communist leader, which AG, through his own intelligence sources, was able to provide. A few days later, AG was in the office of this Uruguayan police captain, and they were talking about the normal business they talk, you know, we'll give you money for this project, we'll train you in that project, and whatever. And AG started to hear screams down the hall. And A.G. knew what those screams were because he'd been in this business for a while and it was a man being tortured down the hall. And A.G. got this terrible realization that perhaps the man that he had just fi fingered to the Uruguayan police was the guy being tortured down the hall. But he didn't want to say anything. And he felt that, you know, if he said something it might uh, hurt the delicate relations between the CIA and the Montevideo police force. And the police captain was similarly embarrassed and perhaps didn't want to say anything and he kept turning up the radio in the room as the screams got louder the man kept turning up the radio louder and louder and louder until I suppose when everything got overwhelming they broke off the meeting and AG did find out later that the man being tortured down the hall while the radio was turned up was indeed a local communist whose AG as a representative of the CIA had fingered to the local police force so we keep that story in mind. I mean, that's a first-hand account of a CIA operative who was there. I mean, for, no one's challenged AG's facts. A lot of people challenge his politics and his motivations, but no one is challenging AG's facts, even in the CIA. Now, I want to read to you a, a couple of pages from an interview, and it's all verbatim, that I had with a former CIA operative within the last two months. And this guy served in Latin America, and he served in Vietnam. And uh, he talked to me very frankly, and I'm going to read this to you. You have to understand when I talk about PICS, that stands for Provincial Interrogation Centers, which were interrogation centers which the CIA built in every Vietnamese province, and paid for, constructed. They all had similar designs. They had rooms for interrogation. They had rooms with ja you know, jail rooms and things of that sort. But remember, PICS stands for Provincial Interrogation Center. Okay, I'm reading verbatim. Nothing of this has changed except a few words which I changed so you can't pinpoint who the guy is because it's a little bit more specific. And this is the CIA operative talking. And he says, but again, I never personally thought in terms of morality. I received a directive. This is what to, was to be accomplished and I was graded on achieving objectives. Get it done. Now if somebody made out an assignment to kill somebody, I certainly would worry about the morality of that. But if I were working against Che Guevara, what the hell? He was, whatever he was doing was totally illegal. So however I went about getting him, if it was maybe putting an individual into Bolivia illegally, a black entry into the country, which is the greater illegality? And I said to him, that seems to be an attitude that's rather common, that everything is for the greater good and for the national security. He replies, again, I can't think of ever setting out or even wanting somebody to be hurt, maimed, or killed. There were illegalities, but they were little illegalities. And if someone got hurt, generally speaking, it would be when we didn't have a pure controlled operation. And by that I mean if we were using the police. Because these people, their mentality is different than ours. They're totally brutal. They used to publicize these pics over in Vietnam, the provincial interrogation centers. They were under our jurisdiction and control. And they drove me up a damn wall, spending half of my time going from pick to pick. And by God, I had those things neat and clean and orderly. And then the next thing I'd find that down in one province, somebody had gotten the hell beat out of it. That was never authorized or directed. We would raise all kinds of hell, and it was like talking to a stone wall. These people, meaning the Vietnamese, uh, just have the mentality where force and might makes right, and they totally hate and dislike one another, and they're going to beat the hell out of each other. The CIA assumed an awful lot of blame. Our only, responsible, our only responsibility was to set, up, set these up and the purpose of them, which never, uh, which never provided anything that we wanted theoretically. We had the functional jurisdiction. Then we, we did the funding and financing at least. Of course, they were, special, they, they were special branch operated, and we did have some power in the special branch, and we were supporting and financing them. But the tortures, oftentimes we wouldn't even know about it. 
We'd hear about it because some newspaper man was floating through the area, and how in the name of God he'd find out. But we'd read it in the paper, or we'd get a cable in from Saigon. And what the name of God is happening in your damn pick now? And off we'd go. We never as an agency uh, instigated either torture or violence. <sighs> now there were times when we knew the way certain policemen were. Guatemalans are vicious. And they'll stand somebody up in a basement or put them out in the cold, freezing water, and so on and so forth. Then maybe the Brazilians use their electronic devices and so forth. We know that. We tell them not to. <laughs> they say, all right, we're not going to do it. But we're, also not going to be pre pre but we're also not going to be present during these interrogations. Again, because I don't like to see that sort of thing. If I am there, they're not going to do it in all probability. And as, I, as soon as I leave, they're going to haul the guy back, they'll tell me. We, they'll tell me. We talked to him for two hours. That's the main thing. And hell, they'd keep him for 24 hours. We know this. We do try to get them to change their techniques and procedures. But they're not going to change. They never have and they never will. And they know damn well that if they're ever thrown out of power, they're going to undergo the same thing because of the revenge motive. And in some of these countries, it's been working back and forth for 100 years and will always continue to do so. But by the, time it get pub by the time it gets publicized, because the agency may be supporting, financing, or even advising a given group, whatever that group does, then their sins come back to the agency. And it really isn't fair. And that's how most of us would look on it when we're involved. Well, that's the clandestine mentality. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a complete separation of personal morality from the acts that these people commit in the name of our national security and our government. And that's the kind of people that we're trying to get, you know, get eliminated from positions of power and positions of influence. That's also the kind of person who is probably not going to tell the truth to a Senate committee. In fact, William Buckley, I guess, who was with God and Yale at Man, Man at Yale before he got into the National Review and into the CIA, which he was in, has written a column advising Director Colby to lie to the Senate committees, he says, to protect the agency and the national security. And that's the kind of folks we're dealing with. And that, it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, it's not an easy thing to get to the bottom of what these people have been doing around the world. And we're not talking about people who have a predilection to tell the truth. We are talking about people who love their kids, who mow their lawns, who if you sat down with them in a bar, they would probably be fairly charming. You would start understanding their point of view. I mean, they are human beings. They're not unquestioning automatons. But they completely separate their personal work from any sense of personal morality. And that is an awfully important distinction. So I, all I want to say is that perhaps the time has come for the rest of us, who after all are paying the bills through our tax dollars, or partially paying the bills for this kind of thing, to take on some of the responsibility for these kinds of actions which are being committed in our name all over the world. I mean, we can keep our radios up just so loud, and soon we may start hearing some of those screams. And I think that the time has come to eliminate the clandestine portion of the Central Intelligence Agency, to make the United States subject to at least a minimum standard of international law and international responsibility. I mean, people are going to argue that, well, the Soviets have a KGB. Isn't this an effective weapon in an international struggle? I would remind you that bacterial warfare is a very effective wa weapon in international struggles, but that the United States has decided, for reasons of our own, that that is perhaps below the minimal standard of warfare that we're allowed to use. And I would submit that the dirty tricks and covert action of the CIA are also below that minimal standard. And the sooner the United States gets out of this business, the better. For more information about the Central Intelligence Agency, contact Center for National Security Studies, 122 Maryland Avenue, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 2002. This program was produced at radio station WWUH in West Hartford, Connecticut.